and we'll watch Christmas TV. It is brutal, it's brutal, why can't you see? It's brutal, it's brutal, why have you? I'm watching Christmas on TV and wishing you were here with me. Merry Christmas from one million miles. Welcome to the Weird Christmas Podcast. This is Craig Kringle from WeirdChristmas.com, and I wanted to start off the Christmas season with a show to give you a lot of seriously messed up suggestions to fill your holiday viewing this year. You know you're bored with the same old traditional standbys you can quote till your family wants to sew your mouth shut with garland. So I spoke with Joanna Wilson, who's written a number of books about Christmas television and runs a site I visit far too often called ChristmasTVHistory.com, and she knows her Christmas TV. She wrote, Tis the Season TV, the encyclopedia, which catalogs every Christmas made-for-TV movie and Christmas episode she could find. Then, she sat down to watch A Christmas Story for a full 24 hours and wrote about that in the Triple Dog Dare, filled with trivia and background on the show, as well as chronicling her own fragile mental state throughout the whole thing. She's written a couple of others, but the book I wanted to ask her about was my favorite, called The Christmas TV Companion, a guide to cult classics, strange specials, and outrageous oddities. You can see it fits my aesthetic. I can't help but love a book with chapters like Get Ready for the Weirdest Christmas Ever, Have Yourself an Eerie Little Christmas, Christmas Stars and Men from Mars, and Nutty as a Fruitcake, Outrageous Animation. I mean, this thing is just filled with suggestions for every off-center holiday viewing mood you could ever be in. Need to know every Christmas episode of Married with Children? She's got you covered. How many 70s variety shows went with hastily produced Christmas specials? They're all there. Want a lineup of Santa-themed slasher flicks? She'll hook you up. I mean, this thing is amazing. It's so good I've got both the Kindle and the paper versions. She was kind enough to chat with me, and I asked her how she got into this whole thing in the first place. About the year 2000, I got a book as a gift. It, it was the book on the history of the animation company Rankin Bass. A lot of people know Rankin Bass because they created, uh, you know, the TV special Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer in 1964. Anyway, I read this book. Um, I loved it. I love anything connected to television, but I just loved uh, going back and remem- reading this book and remembering these old uh, TV specials. And I began to do more research on Christmas entertainment in general. What other TV specials were uh, created, you know, during the 70s, 60s, 70s, and 80s. I began to rewatch these things and find them at libraries and and video stores and uh, talk to my friends and family about these things. And I soon began to realize, um, you know, we watch and consume Christmas entertainment differently than we watch any other uh, genre of movie or uh, television specials. And I just sort of turned my personal project into something more professional and began uh uh, documenting uh, dates and names and directors and production companies for uh, Christmas entertainment in general. And that eventually became the research for the encyclopedia, Tis the Season TV. And that was the first one that you did, right? Well, it, it took my publisher a really long time to put, turn the, uh, the, my research of the encyclopedia um, into a book. And so I was actually able to write the companion before and get that out before the encyclopedia was ready to be released as a book. Gotcha, gotcha. Very cool. Well, you mentioned Rankin Bass. I have to say, one of my one of my favorites because it's so odd is Leprechaun's Christmas Gold, and uh, not just of Rankin Bass, but of all the Christmas specials I think that I've seen, um, because. I'm never quite sure exactly what the connection to Christmas is. <laughs> I mean, it's there, um, <laughs> but it's but it's it's so not what you would normally think of as as a Christmas story. Oh yeah, um, that's a very popular um, Rankin Bass stop motion animation, 1981 Rankin Bass Christmas special. It really draws from Irish folklore. It includes obviously leprechauns, but it also includes a banshee witch character, which is really uh, kind of over the top and outrageous. And, you know, if you remember, uh, this uh, special sort of explains how the Christmas gold came to Ireland, told by an Irish sailor character. Um, <laughs> it is kind of weird and, and fairly outrageous. It's nice, you know, to kiss your bow while cuddling under the mistletoe. And Santa Claus, you know, of course, is one of the boys from home. The door is always open, the neighbors pay a call. Father John, before he's gone, will bless the house and all. Rankin Bass also made um, a couple other kind of weird ones that are a little farther, you know, out out of the norm. Uh, Jack Frost, if you'll remember 
that's another Animagic special they did. And I love the villain in Jack Frost. He's this strange steampunk character that's got a Russian edge to him. It's pretty crazy. And, and actually, I also like um, The Life and Adventures of Santa Claus. Um, it's inspired by an L. Frank Baum story. Uh, everybody knows Baum from uh, The Wizard of Oz, the original author of Wizard of Oz. But he also wrote a short story called Life and Adventures of Santa Claus that Rankin Bass adapted. It's very pagan. It's very fantasy. It's got this weird Lord of the Rings feel to it, if you're familiar with that style of fantasy storytelling. It's pretty outrageous for um, Christmas entertainment, but that's a fun watch, too. How shall I begin this story of the life and adventures of Santa Claus? At the beginning, Master Woodsman. Yes, the beginning. We live so happily here in the forest that we know nothing of the sorrow and misery that falls to the lot of those poor mortals who inhabit the open spaces of the earth. It was a short 60 years or so ago an instant in immortal time that I came upon the babe abandoned in the snowy woods at the very edge of the forest. I remember seeing that one randomly. Like, when I was a kid, I remember it came on. And at the time, I mean, because I had been reading, like you said, Tolkien, and I was I was that kind of kid. And I can remember just being fascinated by, it's like, here's Santa Claus and fairies. Like, not elves, but like wood nymphs and fairies and all these other strange creatures. Yes. And then I never <laughs> saw it again for years. And so I actually went through this whole period of my life wondering, did I dream that? Was that a real thing? Because I hadn't caught the, <laughs> that it was by L. Frank Baum, and so I had no idea. And it just it never showed up again. I'm just curious, since you've seen so much, what are some of the things that you think are some of the strangest TV specials? Well, and I'm sort of drawn to the ones that are, uh, many people call strange or weird. I like the ones that sort of break the rules of what we expect from a traditional Christmas story. So this is actually uh, a very interesting question for me. And one of the first things that always comes to my mind is I love this 1964 movie called Carol for Another Christmas. I've seen this movie several times. It always uh, pulls me back in. It's clearly an adaptation of, you know, Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol, but it's told from a very, very specific point of view. It's very Cold War. Again, 1964, but it was uh, sponsored by Xerox, and it's pro-United Nations. Oh, wow. And so it's uh, it's all about pushing diplomacy, <laughs> and it's very Cold War, but it's filled. It's It had a very substantial budget at for that time. And it includes, you know, this huge cast of, um, of Hollywood favorites. Um, it Sterling Hayden is the main character. It also has Peter Sellers and Britt Eklund and Ben Gazzara. I mean, it's just an amazing tale, but from a very specific point of view. And one of my favorite things about it, it's written by Rod Serling. It oh, really wow. carries a yeah, it really carries a certain weight of this pro-United Nations, anti-war Dickens tale. I've been giving things some thought, some, uh, some second thoughts. Oh, any conclusions? No, maybe an observation or two. For instance, for instance, the old woman. But now, by now. But no man, as the poet says, is an island. Seems the conclusion is inevitable. There must be involvement. Every man's death does diminish me. It appears we've run out of the luxury of alternatives, Fred. We find ourselves living in a world in which we either Greet the morning, or accept the night. So I wish you a Merry Christmas, Fred. And a good morning. Merry Christmas, Uncle. And it used to be the holy grail of, you know, Christmas movies, Christmas TV movies. It was very difficult to find. And then Turner Classic Movies several years ago found it and began airing it every year. And so now at the holiday time, you can actually find it. Uh, keep your eye on Turner Classic Movies and you can find it. It was actually um, produced by uh, Joseph Mankiewicz. 
who uh, now the host of Turner Classic Movies, one of the major hosts is Ben Mankiewicz, and I believe he's the great nephew of Joseph Mankiewicz, and that's probably that connection is what brings it back to Turner Classic Movies. But uh, keep your eye out for that. Carol for Another Christmas. It's a great, it's a great uh, off, you know, left of norm sort of movie to keep your eye out for. That's awesome. That's awesome. Any, what about like cartoons? I know, I know a lot of people, they're, they're always some interesting takes, especially it seems like recently, every, every TV show or cartoon show that I know my kids watch, there still always has to be some kind of Christmas special. Are there any animated ones that you think are, are even more unusual than normal? Oh, sure. Uh, in, in children's entertainment, uh, one of the first ones that comes to my mind that's a favorite of mine is uh, Chowder. Chowder has a Christmas episode. And are you familiar with Chowder yep. from Cartoon Network? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That entire series is <laughs> outrageous. And their Christmas episode is pretty outrageous as well. Um, and it, 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 that character is, you know, it, obsessed with food and and being a cook, and so it, it envelops that entire uh, universe in it. Another great series that also has a great holiday episode is The Marvelous Misadventures of Flapjack from 2009, Low Tidings Day uh, episode. <laughs> it, it creates this, uh, it's not exactly Christmas, it's a parallel to Christmas, and so um, <laughs> they never use the word Christmas, but this Low Tidings Day that they celebrate in Flapjack's uh, universe is very parallel. And it actually, quite a few children's uh, series do that. They don't exactly uh, recreate Christmas, but they create a parallel, um, and, and Flapjack does that. And as these imaginative uh, shows that are created for children also include Christmas, there's quite a few uh, animated series, you know, Adult Swim, mm-hmm. that are created for more adult taste. There's quite a few Adult Swim uh, Christmas episodes, too, for adults, like Squid Billies, Super Jail, Moral Oral, Tom Goes to the Mayor. That's one of my favorites. <laughs> oh, what, what um, happens in that one? Uh, well, <laughs> Tom... Tom wants to get in on the, uh, if I remember correctly, he wants to get in on the holiday retail sales at the local mall. And so he uh, creates a slogan for a T-shirt, rats off to you, and uh, ends up selling his T-shirts down at the mall. Um, it's hilarious. If you if you like Tom Goes to the Mayor, then you'll definitely like that uh, Christmas episode as well. Well, what about one of the things in the, the TV companion book that I found interesting was the ones where they would always veer into like, really depressing or sort of like almost as sort of existential kinds of sort of emptiness like at the end. And I'm trying to remember, Oh, I had it, I had it written down and I don't know where I put it, but there was one where you mentioned, uh, and I can't remember if it was a cartoon where it ends with an image of a little boy in the middle of a street and it just pulls back and he's completely alone in the universe or something like that. Boy, God, this sure didn't turn out to be the best Christmas ever. But you still have two minutes left, and I have faith in you. That's moral oral, yeah, and that's uh, that. Se- that entire series is really a parody of Davy and Goliath. If mm-hmm. you're familiar with that series, it, it puts it in this spiritual religious context. But this uh, modern day parody of uh, Davy and Goliath called Moral Oral, his spiritual <laughs> um, challenges here in the holiday episode are just so gut wrenching and so. I, to say offensive is just an understatement. I don't even know how far to go with this. Um, <laughs> it's you, it, it's outrageous to say the least. And um, once you see it, you don't forget it. You're you're left with this um, lack of spiritual. Uh, he is left uh, with this existential crisis, um, which is so you know un Christmassy. It's so mm-hmm. beyond what we usually expect from traditional Christmas animation. It's uh, it's pretty funny. That's great. That's awesome. What about that? Are there any others that you think are really depressing like that? I mean, I know I know everybody talks about, you know, certainly t- Christmas is a time when many people suffer seasonal depression and things like that. But are there any other specials, animated or not, that, that really kind of play to that, like that really get dark? Well, I can think of some movies that are downright depressing. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and yet that, 
to make a depressing Christmas story really does seem against the spirit of the holiday. And, and that's also what makes it strange and so unusual to watch. Uh, most Christmas movies or Christmas stories, they are, you know, by definition, what it is to be Christmassy, they're hopeful, they're optimistic, they're light, they have a happy ending. And so to create a Christmas story that's actually against that, um, to be depressing and to be, uh, to take away that sort of light seems, uh, really strange and unusual. And one of the first movies that come to my mind is this 1957 movie called All Mine to Give. Um, and I talked about this in the companion. Um, <laughs> It is. I have to every time I watch it, you know, I have to set out a box of tissues. I have to get ready for this. Um, <laughs> my sinuses are going to get cleared out watching this. This movie, I can't believe they made this. Who thought that this was a good idea? I don't know. But it's about um, <laughs> a Scotch immigrant family in the Midwest um, setting up home. It, it's like Minnesota or Wisconsin, you know, somewhere up in the uh, Midwest. And the mother and the father die. But the mother's last words to her six children are to the oldest son, keep the family together, find your siblings a home. You need to survive out here in, you know, the 19th century uh, immigrant community. And so the oldest son is like 10 or 12 years old. And the rest, <laughs> of, the movie, the rest of the movie is him putting his siblings, his younger siblings, on a sled and dragging them door to door on Christmas Day, asking all his neighbors to take in his siblings one by one so that they'll have a family and they'll have a chance to survive and they'll have a roof over their heads and uh, in the deep snow and they'll have uh, food. It is, and the siblings are crying because they don't want to be split up and they've just lost their parents. I mean, this is gut-wrenching and horrible. What you gonna do? Make a list of families that like kids. What about the Tylers? They're well fixed. The Tylers is for who? Annabelle. All they've got is Howie and Bruce. They might like a girl to help Mrs. Tyler. Well, maybe. But it don't cut no ice what we think. Mama said I was to decide. And if I don't quit, we'll all end up in the state home orphans. That's what we are, aren't we? No one, we never will be. Well, anyway, they won't let you decide. Not if I wait till day after tomorrow. And tomorrow's the best day for me to do what Mama told me. But tomorrow's Christmas. That's just it. On Christmas, we ought to get just about anybody we want to take any of us in, see? And at the end of the <laughs> at the end of the movie, you know, thank God this 12-year-old boy is successful. He's able to pawn off his five siblings to the neighbors. And what does he do? Does he take in one of the neighbors finally offers him a shelter, too? And he's like, no, no, thanks. He walks off into the snow drifts headed for a lumber camp. He's going to work for a living. He's like 12. Oh I mean, like, and this is a 1957 movie and it's on Turner Classic Movies. You can find it around. It's on DVD. I find it at the library. I mean, who thinks this is a great idea? Who watches this? And, sits around with the family and is happy, uh, feels better about themselves and, and the holiday season for this movie. It's, it's, uh, if you've got a certain sense of humor, it's a lot of fun to watch. That is amazing. I think I found my new favorite Christmas movie then. Yeah. Well, let's see. Another one that you mentioned in your book that, that I had never heard of but that seemed fascinating was called A Cosmic Christmas. Could you say a little bit about what that one is? Because I think that's something that more people should see. Yeah. A Cosmic Christmas is a Canadian-made TV special. Uh, it was created by Nelvana, which is actually a huge uh, Canadian animation company who've created quite a few other things. But this is, you know, inspired by the craze in the late 70s, started by Star Wars and, and Close Encounters of the Third Kind, the popularity of space stories and aliens. Um, this is a Christmas story animated for television that includes space creatures. And if I remember correctly, it starts with a little boy named Peter, and he's got a pet goose named Lucy, and he's walking through his downtown city streets during Christmas, admiring, you know, Christmas windows and, and whatnot. And sure enough, he sees um, movement in the night sky, and it's an alien spaceship with three aliens that come down, and he speaks to them, and they want to know more about what... Christmas is, and as he, as he describes Christmas as the season of goodwill and love and generosity and coming together of people, all around them, they're watching quite the opposite. People in the community are greedy, they're 
bumping into each other and angry. They're short tempered. The aliens aren't witnessing, you know, the, the, the definition of Christmas that Peter just described. Our mission is to search for the meaning of that star. You must mean Christmas. Did you come for Christmas? Christmas? Christmas. What is Christmas? How do we measure it? You don't. The star that you saw shone over Bethlehem because Jesus Christ was born there. He was very special. This is his birthday. We celebrate it every year with love, peace, and caring for others. And that's Christmas. Then that is what we've come for. Well, come on, we'll show you. And so uh, it's an interesting journey just to, once again, redefine Christmas. An awful lot of these uh, animated TV specials do this. They sort of um, draw in children's uh, narratives in order to redefine Christmas and explain the mythology of uh, the holiday season. In the end, of course, there's a happy ending and um, the aliens learn the positive message. And we humans also here on Earth are, you know, re-inspired to embrace the spirit of the holiday. It's actually a very pleasant, happy uh, animated tale. And it has charmed quite a few people that saw it originally in the 70s. It aired year after year through the 70s and early 80s. And so there are quite a few uh, loyal fans who still remember it and um, admire this and, and look to watch it again each year to recapture that holiday spirit. That's great. That's great. One thing that I did not know about until I read your book was the Captain and Tennille special. And then after you mentioned that, I had to hunt it down on, on YouTube. And that, that thing is amazing. <laughs> I love how it starts. Um, that would, could you take us through, especially how it starts, which I think is one of the best things I've seen sure. in a long time. Sure. And one of everybody's, everybody loves to watch these classic 70s variety TV specials you know, at holiday time, you know, maybe they're not fun to watch. They're too, you know, from the past to, to watch in, the, in July or in August or September. But come Christmas time, we're ready to watch these classic vintage uh, variety TV specials. And one of the weirdest ones is the 1976 Captain and Tennille Christmas special. My favorite musical number is Captain and Tennille are dressed, you know, in their holiday finery. And they're um, performing a Latin-inspired Jingle Bells production number. But they're, uh, Tony Tennille is, you know, dressed up like Carmen Miranda. <laughs> and she and Daryl Dragon are riding a motorized, you know, keyboard at organ like a Zamboni on ice to this Latin-inspired Jingle Bells. It is, uh, <laughs> they must have been having a lot of fun with this. There's no way they didn't know how hilarious and fun this production number is. And, and once you see it, you can't forget it. It's a lot of, it's, uh, you'll be laughing all through the holiday season. Another memorable uh, variety special is uh, from the early 80s, Rich Little's Christmas Carol. Mm -hmm. And this is another adaptation of, you know, Charles Dickens' Christmas Carol. But this is Rich Little, who's, you know, made his career doing impressions of, you know, celebrity voices. And he plays every character in the Christmas Carol, but he does it with some celebrity voice. And so who he chooses, what celebrity voices he chooses for each character is amazing. I am always entertained every time i watch this i'm laughing i'm i love the spirit that he brings to this thing it's worth seeking out this dvd so you can watch it again it's hilarious his ebenezer scrooge character he does with the voice of wc fields <laughs> his bob cratchit character he does in the voice of you know the put upon paul lind his jacob marley is um richard nixon <laughs> His ghost of Christmas past is Humphrey Bogart. I mean, you get the point. Even his tiny Tim is Truman Capote, who, you know, the, the famous uh, author who is known for being short of stature and being outrageous and whiny himself. Uh, the ghost of Christmas future is Inspector Clouseau, you know, Peter Sellers. Uh -huh, uh -huh. It's, it's so much fun uh, just to, to follow along with those crazy voices and, uh, 
it's it's a fun showcase for Rich Little. Yeah, and when I went back and watched that, it was the the Capote one was what got me more than anything else because it was just so out of place. It was so it was great. It was so good. It was yeah. Great. That's cool. That's cool. That and one other one that I have to mention. You mentioned in your book, but it's something that I saw a long time ago. Well, I guess not too long ago, but my kids were into Yo Gabba Gabba, and the Yo Gabba Gabba Christmas special was as bizarre as anything else that shows up on that show. Um, and I know it's hard to explain some of the sketches in there if you haven't seen the show and you don't know why these random people are doing sort of random things. But what are some of the best bits from that one? Yeah, that Yo Gabba Gabba uh, Christmas episode from 2007 is a lot of fun. And if you're a fan of the series, then you'll really love the Christmas episode, too. And one of my favorite bits is Mark Mothersbaugh, who's in throughout the series, but he's in the Christmas episode uh, instructing the children how to draw a snowman. Which and we is should say, if you don't know, but if you do, if you remember Devo, he was the man behind Devo. And and so he is now in this kid's show. So I think he actually helped produce it, if I'm right. But uh, Yeah, he so. does. He's a visual artist as well as a musician. And many people know him from Devo. But he continues to work in the music industry. He does uh, soundtracks to movies. He still does an awful lot of music. He did all the music for Pee Wee's Playhouse. He's still, uh, you know, a huge player in the industry. And one of the things I love about, too, is Mark Mothersbaugh is from my hometown. He's from Akron, Ohio, and that's oh, where I cool. live. And so, yeah, there's a personal connection. And every once in a while, you'll see him walking. Uh, he'll come to town, and it's great to uh, see him walking around. Speaking of Pee-wee's Playhouse, that's another one that after your book I had to go watch again. Because I know I had seen that as a kid, but it didn't strike me as quite so strange back then. It was just, It was still just Pee-wee. But to watch that thing now... <laughs> it's just it's that's so a, yeah that's a classic yeah and, and, yep. and um there are so many great guest stars in that that just perfectly reflect his style and his taste i mean it, it includes uh dinah shore and mm-hmm. Cher and little richard little richard yeah that was the that, that was the thing i hadn't remembered and then he pop, he comes in there and oh it just it it's so wonderful it's so wonderful and my my favorite music number in that Pee-wee's Playhouse Christmas is, of course, Grace Jones singing Little Drummer Boy as she bursts <laughs> through a box. I mean, this is just fantastic Christmas entertainment. It doesn't get any better than this. Okay, Pee-wee. It's Grace Jones! Wait a minute. You're not the president. You're Pee-wee Herman. Duh! This package was supposed to go to the White House not the playhouse. Sorry, Grace. Back in the box. Since I'm already here, would you mind if I sang a song? No, go right ahead. What are you waiting for, Christmas? Another thing that you do that I really like is that throughout the year, on your website and on your your Twitter feed, you've got suggestions. And I know you did. A, I was just too late this year to to do the Christmas in July sort of viewing party that you have. Um, yeah, we love doing that. That's a fun thing every year. Join us next year. That'd be fun. That's I, oh, I plan on it. But what is it for other people? Tell. Can you say real quickly what it is? Sure. Uh, it, in July every year, it's a little bit easier to celebrate Christmas in July. Uh, in December, everybody gets really busy, and you know they want to, they want to spend their extra time with their families, which I I totally understand. And so uh, my community or uh, the community around my website likes to come together in July, and we talk about Christmas entertainment. And I usually pitch a series of questions, about five questions, just to sort of spark conversation and and uh, come at Christmas entertainment from a slightly different new perspective to get us to express ourselves. And we all respond. And then I post them uh, one a day, usually throughout the month of July. And it's just a place to come together and to talk about our favorite Christmas movies and, um, and TV specials and talk about what uh, excites us about uh, watching these classics and the new stuff as well. It's a lot of fun. I welcome everybody to come and join us. I usually do the announcement in June. So on my website, christmastvhistory.com. 
And so look for that announcement. You'll see the questions and then just follow the instructions. And I think we've been doing this three or four years, five years maybe. Um, but yeah, join us in 2018. It'll be a lot of fun. I will definitely be there, and I'll try and get as many people as I can to. And then I also like on your Twitter, um, which is Tis the Season TV, if I remember correctly, if I've got it yes. right. Um, yes. And then you post a lot of what – it's been great because I'll check in the morning and see whatever you've done the, the day before. And sometimes work gets started a little bit later because I'll have had to sit there and watch Alice's 70s Christmas special or the other one that just came up. And just it's it's great. So there's there's great stuff all through the year. On there right. Well, I, I, so. I, on social media, I share things all year round. Uh, it's Christmas all year round in my head. So I share that. <laughs> I share that with everybody. I share not only uh, videos that uh, are available for everybody to watch uh, online from classic uh, Christmas entertainment, but I also share archives from my website. I've been writing about uh, Christmas episodes and movies and specials uh, on my website. I, I share the archives of that. Um, I've been doing that for like seven or eight years, and so I've got quite a lot of archives, um, and we I share those uh, throughout the year as well. Awesome, awesome. And then are you working on a book now? Is there a new one coming out? Um, I'm always working on updating the encyclopedia. Gotcha. Um, there are over 3,000 listings, uh, it, but – you know, Christmas entertainment is a growing field. There are between 120 and 150 new Christmas uh, entertainments released every year, and that number is growing. Um, so I'm always adding that to the database, and uh, hopefully if my publisher uh, is ready for it, someday uh, I'll uh, come up with an updated version of the encyclopedia. That would be great. Well, everything else that you've done, you have a book on on uh, watching a Christmas story, which I know right. too. And Triple Dog Dare just came out last year. Uh, that's my most recent book. That's uh, about the phenomenon of the twenty four hour marathon on a, on <laughs> a Christmas story on cable TV. One year, I actually sat down and instead of the Christmas, just the Christmas story, for some reason, my DVD was set to. Uh, to have the director's cut and I never turned it off and I had 24 hours or not the director's cut, but the commentary. And so I had 24 hours of the commentary with the director and Peter's, Peter Billingsley for 24 hours in my head. So oh, that's great. Uh, it, yeah, yeah, <laughs> I think so. <laughs> so I know I can remember more random facts now because of that um, than anything else. I'm glad I was doing other things at the time <laughs> at the same time, but it was fun. Well, good. Well, thank you so much for talking to me. And, and Joanna, thank you very much. Thank you for the conversation. If you visit weirdchristmas.com, you can get links to all of Joanna Wilson's books, as well as her website, christmastvhistory.com, and her various social media accounts, especially the Twitter one, which is great. I'll also give links to the shows we talked about. And as always, thank you for listening. You can always get in touch with me at weirdxmas at gmail.com. Follow all the weirdest vintage postcards and images on Twitter, Tumblr, Facebook, and Instagram, or read my latest ramblings at weirdchristmas.com. And I would truly, sincerely, deeply appreciate it if you'd leave a quick review on iTunes, or even just a quick star rating. The more feedback I get on there, the faster all this weirdness will shoot straight up the old iTunes chimney. So until next time, here's hoping Santa doesn't stuff you in his bulging, sweaty sack. Someone said I need a tagline in the podcast. That's about as good as you're going to get. Me and my